Mm. Lighting okay, guys? Lighting okay? Oh, boy. Mm. I didn't know you're from Muslim background. I don't know, should I mention it or not? Hello, everyone. Hello, my friends. Hello. Hey, you guys, what's happening, guys? How are you? A lot to cover today by the grace of the Triune God, by the grace of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus, grace of the Holy Spirit, the one true God, whom we love, worship, and adore, who's in love with us. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Just wait for the regulars to show up. Alex, good to see you, brother. Lisa, how are you, sister? You were here in the beginning of the session yesterday, but then did you leave, or are you still listening till the end? Lisa. <clears throat> here it is. Almost one second. Okay. Just waiting for a few more minutes. We'll begin talking about Hello, everyone. Hey, Mar Rob, Rebel. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Rebel SSJ Turk. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Hopefully, we'll do <clears throat> an exposition of John chapter 1, not the entire prologue, and Nur ministry. I like that name, and Nur, the light ministry. The light of Jesus shine through you for his glory. Yes, guys, do pray for Hafsa's family, her father, Ahmed. Sadly, he has the name of Muhammad, the false prophet. Hafsa comes out of a Muslim background. She's asking the saints to pray for the salvation of her family members. Pray for Hefsa's father and family members who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ to come to know Jesus and be saved. Like Jesus Christ saved Hefsa out of Islam. And may the Lord Jesus preserve her for his glory and protect her in Jesus' name. Yeah, no, at least I, I, you did make some comments yesterday, but then it's like I didn't hear from you. So I was just wondering if you were there listening to the entire session. And I hope it was beneficial. Naom. Hey, Igor. Lord bless you. Lord Jesus, watch over you. And Igor, can I ask you a question? So you are a Trinitarian, right? You're a Trinitarian. You love the triune God, obviously. That's why you're here. Okay, God bless you. The triune God preserve you. The blood of the Lamb, Jesus, wash you. Wash all of us. And the Holy Spirit crucify our flesh and seal you and seal us for the glory of Jesus Christ. And I say this in love, brother. Can I say something to you as a brother who loves you for the sake of Jesus? And that's why I'm teaching. I'm teaching because I want Jesus to use me to bless the church because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll love his flock, his, his sheep. My brother in Christ, as a follower of the triune God, and I say this in love, you are not supposed to be with an unbeliever. Notice what you just said in your comments. You just said your girlfriend's a Joe Witness. As a Trinitarian, you are not to be dating anyone who doesn't love and worship the triune God. Okay, that's number one. And number two, brother, Igor, and I'm not saying you are. Don't misunderstand me. Don't think I'm saying this. you're doing this. Unless you've been given the gift of celibacy, and I'm praying for that. If God wants me to be celibate, to give me that gift, then everyone is going to struggle with carnal desires. Right? By the power of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus Christ, May he wash us and save us from our flesh and crucify our flesh and our carnal desires to be pure and help me not to fill in that area. So, brother, I am going to encourage you as a brother in Jesus Christ. Not only are you not supposed to be with an unbeliever, but the longer you are with an unbeliever, you will be prone and tempted to engage in intercourse with her before marriage. So you're compounding sin upon sin. First sin is... You're in a serious relationship with an unbeliever. A Jehovah Witness who's taught the Trinity is a doctrine of the devil. And that Jesus is not a man. He's the Archangel Michael. Second sin, and I'm not saying you're doing it, and I don't need to know, Igor. That's between you and Jesus. Okay? That's between you and Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> Unless you're sold out for Jesus, then you're going to be tempted to have sex with this woman. And... The fact that you are even in a relationship with someone who's not a Trinitarian means that you started dating her maybe at a time in your life where you weren't serious about Jesus, right? So now, as you're serious about Jesus and you love Jesus, let me give you advice from my heart. You need to leave her. I'm sorry to say this, brother, 
Brother, there are Trinitarian Christians. Trinitarian Christians who get married end up in divorce. And here, brethren, listen to me, Igor. I open my heart to you. I try to be as an open book as possible, knowing there are people who hate me, want to take my words to slander me and discredit me. The Lord Jesus will deal with them. Brother, I married a woman who claimed to be a Trinitarian, who claimed to give her life to Jesus Christ, who claimed to love Jesus. And we were living in hell for 10 years, verbal abuse, even physical abuse. And then this woman ended up having two affairs using a corrupt legal system, corrupt lawyers to try to destroy me and leave me homeless. You don't want to follow that path. The only good thing that came out of this marriage is my two angels. I thank Jesus. That's the only good thing that came out of it. And may he bless them and love them. I'll never regret that. But I'm telling you, brother, you don't want to follow this path. Amen, daily gripe. We're saying this because we love you. If you love Jesus and you want to give your life to Jesus, witnessing to her is not going to solve the problem. And even as a Jehovah Witness, she's in sin as far as her organization is concerned. Her organization forbids her from dating, number one, especially dating someone who's not a Jehovah Witness. The fact that she's dating you and you're dating her shows that both of you are not really committed to your respective beliefs. And if you're not committed to your respective beliefs, guess what, my friend? And Igor, I don't want you to confess this to me. Confess it to Jesus. If she claims to be a Jehovah Witness, but she's dating you, a Trinitarian, and you're a Trinitarian dating her, that means you guys, when you met each other, you are not really committed to what you believe. And if you're not committed to what you believe, then you're not committed to abstinence. And you guys may be actually sinning by being intimate with each other. And you need to repent for the glory of Jesus. And I'm not saying it's not a struggle. I struggle, but I beg Jesus to save me from my own flesh so I don't shame him and I don't disqualify myself and be a hypocrite. Okay, brother? So I say that because I love you for the sake of Jesus and I'm going to be accountable to what I tell you. I'm not going to tickle your ears and tell you, it's okay, just date her and pray that Jesus will save her. No, there's no such thing as missionary dating. Right? You get my point? Because let me tell you what you're uh, opening yourself to. Let's say you marry and you have children, and she remains a committed Jehovah Witness. Okay? You do need to hear this, Igor. It does, it's not too complicated or complex for you to excuse that you're in a relationship with someone you're not supposed to be. I don't care how complex the issue it is. Jesus says, carry your cross, deny yourself, die to yourself, crucify yourself, and follow his will, no matter how complicated it is. Let me tell you another danger, another danger. If you do marry her and she becomes a devout Jehovah Witness and you have children, you're going to destroy the mental and spiritual health of your children because your children will grow up not knowing what to believe and perhaps not even caring because they see that mommy and daddy are fighting over religion and religion didn't bring any peace in our life. So you're going to even risk the lives of your children. So, brother, take it to heart. You got the testimony of multiple witnesses. The Bible says when you have two or three witnesses telling you something, take that as God speaking to you because God speaks through his church, through people. He even speaks through unbelievers because that's how sovereign he is. And we're all telling you you need to get out of this relationship. So that's between you and Jesus. If you don't, you answer to Jesus, not to me. But Jesus says, here, let me show you what Jesus says. Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Yeah, please, guys, hit the like button. I had about 1,000 views on yesterday's session, only 120 likes. Come on, then YouTube is going to ignore me. They're going to say, this guy's not important like David Wood. Okay, Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Amen, Hafsa. I don't know if Protestant is here. Is here? Okay, watch here. Think not that I can't, that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Get, pay attention, Igor. This is for you. Jesus said, don't think I came to bring peace now. I came to bring a sword to divide. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. 
He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So listen, Igor, it's time to you and all of us. If you love your parents more than Jesus and put them out of Jesus, you're not worthy of Jesus. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his soul, his life shall lose it. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So here's what Jesus is telling you and every one of us. If you don't love me more than your desire, more than that relationship that you know is ungodly, more than whatever it is that goes against my will, that means you don't love me and you're not worthy of me and you don't know me and I don't know you. And he said, so don't think that when you come to me and turn to me and trust in me and love me and make me number one priority, it's going to be a bed of roses because your love for me is going to cause those in your own family who hate me to persecute you, even want to kill you or disown you. And so Jesus is saying, count the cost. Am I worthy, worthy enough for you to lose your family, to lose your job, to lose your relationship, to lose your children, to lose your <clears throat> money? To even lose your life? If yes, then you will be given everlasting life. If no, I don't know you, you don't know me, and I will disown you on the day of judgment. So, Igor, if you cannot give up your Jehovah Witness girlfriend for Jesus, what makes you think you're going to give up your life for him? Let me say, share it again. If you can't even give up a girl for Jesus, you think you're going to give up your life for Jesus? So... May the Holy Spirit take these words and etch it in your heart and convict you until you turn away and give your life to Jesus. So with that said, I know it's easier said than done, Igor. And it's not I want you to get my point. I want you to act on my point. I want you to show that you love Jesus and do what you need to do. Do what's right, brother. And that's it. I won't, I won't give you any more advice. You got it. So... Don't think when I tell you this that I'm living the word perfectly. No, I struggle too. I succumb to my shame. Hypocrite I am. May God save me from my hypocrisy and be merciful to me, a sinner. And show me grace in Jesus' name, especially for the sake of my children. So don't think I'm sitting on a high horse looking down on you. And I mean this. I am not better than you. And I know what's, what it is to struggle. I myself am alone, 47 years old. And I don't have an interest in looking for a companion because I really feel it's hard to find a godly companion sold out for Jesus. And after you've been burned once and I've gone through a legal system that wants to destroy you and not seeing your kids, I don't really have any hope in a godly companion. Now, God is almighty. He may have someone bring that one. That's up to the Lord. But because of that, I too have struggles with carnal desires and needs that I ask Jesus to give me the grace to die to and not succumb to. So don't think I'm sitting on a horse looking down on you. I am not better than you, and I don't say this to try to belittle you, but I have to be honest to Scripture and tell you the truth, even if that truth condemns me because I'm a hypocrite. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us. Right? And that's why, Stephen Universe... You won't date anymore and trust Jesus to bring you a godly woman because all the girls that you dated were agnostic, tempted you to have sex before marriage, and you were sinning against the Lord. Jesus, have mercy on us. Amen? Okay. So with that said, with that said, and let me repeat this again. Guys, missionary dating does not work. What do I mean by missionary dating? Oh, I'll, I'll go out with him. I'll go out with her. And, and, you know, I, 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 I'll just love her to Jesus. Even though she's an unbeliever, even though she's tempting me to sin, or even though he's an unbeliever, he's tempting me to sin, it's okay. By my prayers and my loving loving her or him with the love of Jesus, then they'll get saved and everything will be okay. No, it won't. That's when your hell begins. Okay? That's when your hell begins. You know why your hell begins? Because Jesus Christ will not honor someone who willfully and knowingly engages in a relationship against his will. He will not bless that. He will discipline you. Because he's going to say, son, daughter, you know better. I didn't give you the right to date an unbeliever and justify it by thinking that I'm going to bring them to salvation to make it easier for you. 
No, die to that. Trust me, I have the one for you. If not, I remove my hand of protection and allow you to suffer the consequences. Because God disciplines his children whom he loves as children. As a good parent disciplines their earthly children. And you know what? I have a witness here. Al D is here. Al D is one of my best friends and my brother from my heart. I have a witness here. Okay? He will testify the misery and the hell I went through for 10 years and the hindrance to my ministry because I went ahead of God and married someone that the Lord had given me enough signs not to marry. Am I lying, AD, LD? I couldn't even do ministry because she was a burden on me, right? Even when I was away, I wasn't at peace to do the work of the Lord. LD's a witness if I'm lying. He's here. But I don't blame her. I blame myself because God had shown me enough red flags to run, but I justified it. No, no, no. You know what? She'll change, and she's going to be in love with Jesus, and we're going to be on fire for the Lord. And look at me now. I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. Because you know who suffers? The victims? The children. My daughters. Right? Last night, they called me last night. Just to give you a story. Valentine's Day. Late at night. They got all these Valentine presents, dolls, and candy. They were with some of their friends, right? And I couldn't be there to give them gifts. And my oldest daughter kept telling me, you have to come to my birthday. Come back. My youngest daughter is telling me, come back home. No divorce. A knife in my heart. What can I tell these two girls, these two angels, apart from asking you, cry out to Jesus and beg Jesus, do a miracle for them. Bring them back to my life and chasten their mother to fear you, Lord. And remove this man, Martin Simon Yako. Remove him, Lord, please. You love my children more than I can imagine. Okay. Do you want to go through that, Igor? I woke up heavy heart, sad for them, because I love and ache for them. Don't make this mistake. And I notice here's someone that knows this. When I say no, I don't say this arrogantly. May God have mercy on me. Okay. I don't say, it. but at least I've been teaching the word. So God in his grace has given me some, and I still failed and I still succumbed and I still justified it, right? Because I am still fleshly. I still have sin in my flesh that I war against, right? And if I walk more powerfully in union with the spirit, the stronger I'll be to overcome my flesh. See, Eugene 12. Lord Jesus, bless you, Eugene. Lord Jesus, preserve you and comfort you. Okay? So take that as the Spirit speaking to you through us because we love you. And I promise you, brother, and I promise any one of you that are dating unbelievers, you will be sorry. And you know who's going to suffer because of your selfishness? Your children. They deserve better than that. I am the result of a broken family, a divorce, and I never wanted that for my children. And that's why I endured so much hell and abuse and disrespect because I said, it's okay. As long as I'm in my children's life, I don't care. But God cared because he saw it was destroying me and I was dying. I ballooned to 340 pounds because I hated my life because I loved my children. And I said, it's okay. I'll let... The abuse continue, the disrespect continue, as long as I'm in their life. And Jesus says, no, you're my child too. I will not allow that to happen to you. Okay? It's the truth. See, Joe W., may the Lord Jesus bless you, Joe, and preserve you. I know your pain. Okay, so anyway. Don't follow our footsteps. You're going to regret it, man. Guys, let me just share this final thing. Guys, do bear with me because this brother needed to be ministered to. Remember what our prayer is? That the Holy Spirit will take over every session, guide the discussion for his glory, not my agenda, but the will of the Spirit. So right now, obviously, the Spirit wants this man to hear this. Folks, let me tell you something. You're my family. I know Muslims going to use this slander me and the anti-Trinitarians who hate me for treating them like the swine they are. They're going to use this against me. That's okay. God deal with them. He is my avenger. For 10 years, you know what I would be told? Okay. And I'm not trying to get sympathy here. 
for 10 years because this woman was broken and abused and needs to be healed and needs to be delivered by Jesus. For 10 years, I would hear the woman tell me, I don't love you. I've never loved you. And I'll never be attracted to you. That was the story for 10 years. Until finally I reached the point I didn't care anymore because what mattered was my kids. The Lord's my witness. 10 years I heard that. I don't love you. And that's, I'm giving you a G-rated version. And I even lost my testimony. I even acted the flesh and lost control and said things I shouldn't. That's what everyone asked, Panos. Then why'd you marry him? Oh, he deceived me. He tricked me into marrying because I put a gun to her head. Anyway. Anyway, pray for her. She's broken. She needs Jesus to remember. She's a human creature that Jesus died for. So no matter what she did to me, at the end of the day, she's going to stand before Jesus as I'm going to stand before Jesus. Pray for her healing because if she doesn't get healed, she's going to continue this pattern of destruction. Pray God protects my children from that in Jesus' name. Okay. Now with that said, let's begin. Are you ready? Exactly narrow road. You guys ready now? And those of you who are regulars, I know who you are. And I know that you love me for the sake of Jesus. And I thank Jesus for the love he's put in your heart for me. And I thank you and I love you for the sake of Jesus. Forgive me when I fail you. Forgive me if I offend you. Ask the Lord to change me to be more patient because I love you for the sake of Jesus. If it wasn't for you here, I wouldn't be teaching here. And the Lord Jesus bless you and shine his face on you and preserve you. And I open my wounds because I don't want Igor or anyone else to be wounded. Please run. Please, because I don't want you to then do what we told you not to do. And then years later say, see, Igor, we told you, man. Why do you have to learn the hard way? Please run. And she is not for you. God has someone for you if you trust and are patient. Okay. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, have your way in this session. Anoint my words to speak truth powerfully in union with your spirit. Save me from error and stammering. <clears throat> Grant me clarity of thought and speech. And fill us, not just me, fill us with wisdom and knowledge and understanding from your spirit. And give us the power of your spirit, not just to know your word, but to love your word and live your word perfectly. And please, Father, help us with our flesh, desires of our flesh, not to succumb. Help me in those areas I'm weak, Father. Purify us in the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb. And save us and have mercy on us and pity us and have compassion on us, Father. Don't give us what we deserve. Give us your favor, your mercy, what Jesus earned by his perfect life and death on the cross. And, Father, bless these hurting brothers and sisters. Bless me. Bless the children who are suffering because of bad decisions. My daughters, shield us by the blood of Jesus. Protect us and purify us by the blood of Jesus. And seal us by your spirit, Father. Bless this session, Lord. Fill my chest and my lungs and throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this, and the holiness that we all need to delight you, Father, to make you happy, Father, to make Jesus happy and your spirit happy. Save us from attacks of, of the children of the enemy and save us from losing focus. And, Father, show up in a miraculous way February 19 for me for the sake of my children and bring them to me not in this year but in the upcoming months. So I can put them to sleep again and wake up with them. Please, Abba. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. We love you in Jesus' name. And then one well, final thing, because I just saw Jonathan Simon. Igor, listen, I want you to hear what Jonathan Simon said yesterday. Jonathan Simon, can you put in the comment, because you, you were public about it yesterday. That's why I'm calling you on. How miserable is your situation because you're married to an unbelieving spouse? And you're asking for prayer that Jesus will intervene and save you and convict your wife. And may he do it for the glory of Jesus. Okay, you see, Igor, Jonathan Simon, guys, pray for him. He's in a very difficult marriage, like I was, an unbelieving spouse. And he feels that he can't endure because of the, the abuse. This is not what you want for yourself, Igor. See? Jonathan Simon just said, we go toe-to-toe -to -toe a lot. And unless Jesus intervenes, Jonathan, I don't want to break your heart, discourage you. Unless Jesus intervenes, your marriage won't last. And I'm not prophesying. God forbid I prophesy evil. But unless Jesus convicts her and captures her heart, she's now prone for the enemy 
to bring a man to give her the attention she thinks she deserves only to leave you for an adulterous relationship. That's how it starts. Yeah, ma'am. He wants to marry a Jehovah Witness and he's a Trinitarian. And this woman is not even a devout Jehovah Witness because if she was, she wouldn't be in a relationship with him. Good. Amen. Amen. May he continue to give her dreams. Thank you, Ali Ghaza. And God bless you, Ali, and preserve you and your family for the glory of Jesus. But not everyone ends up getting saved, and it destroys marriages. Ujel, better you wait till you're 100 than marry the wrong one and have your life destroyed and children suffer. Exactly, Pedro. Notice again, Igor, all the brothers and sisters, because we drink from one spirit, we have one father and one savior, Jesus Christ the Father, Son. We're all telling you, leave her. It's not of God. Now, let's begin. Okay, we ready now? See, even life is good. Thank you. From the mouth of two or three witnesses. And may the Lord Jesus bring at least 200 today to hear this. Let's now get into the exposition of the Gospel of John. Let's now get into the exposition of the Gospel of John. Now, I wanted to bring this up yesterday. I didn't have time because we had overtime. Because things come up, important issues come up. Issues that I feel led and compelled by the Spirit to address. Yeah. And the Lord Jesus shine his face on your three beautiful children, Jonathan. And capture them for the glory of Christ. Okay. Guys, I want you to click on that link. By the way, your your version fixed the issue finally. I don't know what that means, Ali Ghaza. I don't know what that means. Anyway, click on that link. It is a Jehovah Witness book. It's called The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived. Click on that link. Now, they made their books available online as PDF files. Okay, there's that link. TAC Maps. I guess you were not listening to me, TAC Maps. Let me try this again. Not all English translations of the Catholic Creed says only begotten son. I've already provided evidence, even from the Catholic Catechism, Catholic Catechism on the Vatican website where they didn't render monogenes or uni genitus as only begotten son. So anyway, let's not get into that. Let's focus. Now that, that link right there, that link right there, you can download the PDF file of the greatest man who ever lived. You know why? Do you know why I want you to download it? Because once you go there, here's the PDF file. Remember what I said about the Jehovah's Witness belief about Jesus. Okay. And I know first last, thank you, Chef Chef. God bless you, sister. And the Lord Jesus work in your husband's heart and bring him to the feet of Jesus. I know first last or Protestant, when this is done in the description box, they'll put the links so people can get this. Here, starting at page 11, let me read what they believe about Jesus Christ. Okay. Because this is going to confirm what I said about the Jehovah's Witness belief concerning Jesus Christ. And this is all part of my discussion, so I don't think I'm going off topic. I'm doing John 1.1 1, 1 in response to the Jehovah's Witness mistranslation of John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, let's read. Starting page 11. Really? Who was he? So you guys with me? I need you to pay attention and focus. You're with me? Because let's read. Okay. Here's what the booklet says. Okay. Really, who was he from the horse's own mouth? So you don't accuse me of misrepresenting them. Jesus' first century associates pondered that question. When they saw Jesus miraculously calm a wind-whipped sea with a rebuke, they wondered in astonishment, who really is this? Later on, on another occasion, Jesus asked his apostles, who do you say that I am? Mark 4, 41, Matthew 16, 15. If you were asked that question, how would you answer? Was Jesus, in fact, God? Many today say that he was. He was. Yet, his associates never believed that he was God. The apostle Peter's response to Jesus' question was, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. Jesus never claimed to be God, but he acknowledged that he was the promised Messiah or Christ. He also said he was God's Son, not God. Let me repeat that again. He also said he was God's son, not God. John 4, 25, 26, John 10, 36. Yet 
The Bible does not say that Jesus was a man like any other man. He was a very special person. Now, guys, here's where I need you to really pay attention by the grace of God's spirit. Okay. <clears throat> he was a very special person because he was created by God before all other things. He was created by God before all other things. Colossians 1, 15. For countless billions of years before even the physical universe was created, Jesus lived as a spirit person in heaven and enjoyed intimate fellowship with his father, Jehovah God, the grand creator. And what do they quote? Proverbs 8, 22 and 27 to 31. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 and 27 to 31, which I need to break down. And if I have time, I'm going to do an interpretation of Proverbs 8 because this is the passage they misuse and misinterpret to show Jesus is a creature. And I'll show you it doesn't teach that. It actually refutes them. Lord willing, I need to cover this. Let's see if I have time to do it here. Then about 2,000 years ago, God transferred. Here's the tricky language. God transferred his son's life to the womb of a woman. Notice what it says. God transferred his son's life to the womb of a woman. And Jesus came to be a human son of God, born in the normal manner through a woman. When Jesus was developing in the womb, and while he was growing up as a boy, pay attention now, he was dependent upon those whom God had selected to be his earthly parents. Eventually, Jesus reached manhood, and when he was granted full remembrance of his previous association with God in heaven. Let me read that last part. When Jesus reached manhood, that's when he was granted full remembrance of his previous association with God in heaven. Did you guys catch it? Did you catch it? Did you guys catch it? You see what they said? Two things should have stuck out. God transferred the life of his son to the womb of Mary. And then Jesus remembered his previous association with Jehovah when he attained manhood. Implication. Notice it didn't say the archangel Michael became Jesus. It said the life of the archangel Michael was transferred to the womb of Mary because Michael ceased to exist. But somehow that life of Michael, his life force, was transferred to the womb of Mary. What does that mean? I don't even think they know. And secondly, they say, that Jesus, until he reached manhood, did not know about his association with Jehovah in heaven before the human Jesus came into being, but then remembered. Did you catch it? That was pages 11 and 12. Now let me read to you another section. When exactly did Jesus remember, or when exactly did Jehovah Awaken Jesus to the fact that that life he had was the life of a spirit creature named Michael that now was transferred to him. Let me show you. This is in this book, which is why I said download it. Use their own sources against them. Okay. Okay, let's go here. Let's find it. Let me find it, guys. Just... Let me get that section. Okay. Talking about Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. Page 43, folks. Page 43. Guys, listen, please. So you know I didn't make it up. When I told you it's what they believe, it's from their own sources. And use this book to show them. Page 43 of the book. Why did Jesus get baptized? Now watch. But more than that happens as Jesus is baptized. The heavens are opened up to him. What does this mean? What does it mean that the heavens were opened up to Jesus when he got baptized? Notice the answer. Evidently, it means, evidently, it means that while he is being baptized, the memory of his pre-human life in heaven returns to him. Thus, Jesus now fully recalls his life as a spirit son of Jehovah God, including all the things that God spoke to him in heaven during his pre-human existence. Wow. Did you catch it? Let me read that part again. Why did Jesus get baptized? Because that's when the memories 
of that spirit creature in Michael, whose life he now possesses, right, <clears throat> came to his recollection, and then he realized, wow, at one point in time, I was a spirit creature in heaven with Jehovah. But when did that come to his remembrance? At baptism. Did you understand what you what I just read? Thank you guys for your support. God bless you. And the super chatters. You know who you are. And those who support me via Patreon, God bless you richly. Did you just understand what I just read? What the Jehovah's Witnesses believe? Number one, the Archangel Michael ceased to exist. Number two, his life force, his life, was transferred to the womb of Mary when the human Jesus came into existence. So it's not that Michael became human. Michael ceased to exist. The human Jesus came into being, and the life force and the memories of Michael were transferred to him. What does that mean? What do you mean the life of Michael was transferred to him? So he's not Michael the angel, but he has the life of Michael. How does that make sense? Right? Yeah. That's true. Even though God bless you, you're contributing the you know super chat. Anything will help. They do take thirty percent off. That's why Narod saying do Patreon because they don't take that much. But anyway, and notice the third thing. When did Jesus recall the memories of the Archangel Michael, that spirit creature whose life force he has, whose life is now transferred to him at baptism. That's when the heavens opened, meaning Jehovah made him remember, oh, wow, wait, I'm not just human? At one time, I was a spirit creature, though I'm not really him, because that spirit creature ceased to exist, but somehow his life and memory has been transferred to me, so I'm not really him, even though I'm supposed to be him. How does that work, society? I don't even think they know. And then uh, let's read the next paragraph. In addition, at the time of his baptism, this is page 43, a voice from heaven proclaims, this is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Whose voice is that? Jesus' own voice? Of course not. It's God's. Clearly, Jesus is God's son, not God himself, as some people claim. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. In addition, at the time of his baptism, a voice from heaven proclaims, this is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Whose voice is that? Jesus' own voice? Of course not. It is God's. Clearly, Jesus is God's son and not God himself, as some people claim. Okay, did you save the link? Exactly, ma'am. Ma'am just cited Luke 12, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 2, when Jesus, when he was 12 years old. Read Luke 2, 41 to 52. We're not going to quote it. Luke 2, 41 to 52 Jesus, at the age of 12, remained behind in the temple at Jerusalem during the Passover. And then when his mother returned looking for him, she told him, why have you done this to your father and I? We've been worried sick, paraphrase. And Jesus says, why? I'm about my father's business in my father's house. Hold on, Jehovah Witness. At the age of 12, Jesus knew God was his father and he was God's son. Luke 2, 41 and 52. Right? Did everyone see? Here's the link again to the PDF file. Here it is. Don't take my word for it. Save the link. And if you want to get it in different versions like audio, they have an audio version where it can be read to you. Here's the link. Yeah, well, it's not. Oh. Oh, I gave you the wrong, that's right, because I gave you the wrong link. I gave you my, I'm sorry, because I downloaded it. Sorry about that. Let me get you the actual link. Sorry. Here's the link to the actual site where you can download it as a PDF file or as an audio text where you can have someone read it out loud to you. My, my bad. But here is the link to, yeah, well, if you go there, you can download it. It says text options, PDF, EPUB, JWPUB. EPUB, JW Pub. It's right there in that link, so I don't give it. Sorry. What I did was I had downloaded it as a PDF uh, file, and I thought it was just the web browser opening up the PDF, not realizing what I had opened was 
the the PDF file I downloaded to my documents. Sorry about that, right, you sinners. All my mistakes is your fault. Anytime I make a mistake, it's your fault, especially Protestant. Everything perfect and good is from the triune God. What's Haxor? What's Haxor on my mic? All right. Try to do it and watch what I do to you guys. Okay. You sinners. Okay. Can you? Thank you, Protestant. Let go, let go remove those links then uh, first and last. Okay. Now that I, we got that out of the way, let's talk about the prologue. Now, I said something yesterday I want to repeat again. I'm what's called an autodidact, meaning self-taught. What do I mean by self-taught? Meaning I didn't go to college. I didn't go to university. I didn't go to sem seminary. I didn't have a pastor or an elder discipling me. What I did was I watched videos. I read books from a variety of voices, right? So that's why I have a massive library that I don't have access to anymore. And you can thank my ex-wife for that too. You know, not to sound sour, but she took the boxes of books that I had in my home when she threw me out through a corrupt legal system, put it in storage. And all those books are in storage in Illinois and I don't have access to them. So thank you. Thank you very much. Anyway, the Lord Jesus is God. He's the Avenger. He will deal with us and may have mercy on all of us and mercy on her. Yep. Now, read books, and most of my books that I read and VHS stuff that I looked at were attacks on the Christian faith. But I did re read literature from Christian men that I believe Jesus guided me to. And now let me tell you about two books that do an excellent job of explaining what's called the prologue of John. That's John chapter 1, verses 118. Two books that you have to have in your library. Okay. Here. Here. Forgotten Trinity. It's been updated, by the way. It doesn't look like this anymore. Dr. James R. White wrote an excellent book. Now it's updated as a different cover on the deity of Jesus Christ. And he has a section on the Holy Spirit. But the great bulk of the book is focused on proving the deity of Christ, that he's the God man, and has a section on the Holy Spirit that's good, and a section on the Trinity. Now he has one of the best chapters on the prologue of john okay what's the prologue of john that john chapter 1 verses 118 that's called the prologue an introduction to the gospel his introduction to the gospel is chapter 4 chapter 4 here it is chapter 4 a masterpiece the prologue of john one of the best guy workleson chapters on john 1 verses 118 so God used this to help me learn because I'm not inventing any new arguments. My exegesis isn't new to me. It's interpretation that you'll find great men and even women of God <clears throat> providing in their <clears throat> commentaries, in their books, in their sermons, even the church fathers. I am simply building on that which was laid before me. One of the best here. Another one I don't have the cover for that you must get, but this one is a little technical. What do I mean by technical? He goes heavily into the Greek, and he doesn't transliterate. Well, no, you know what? Let me take it back. There, he does transliterate the Greek in certain places. This is a book by Dr. Murray J. Harris called Jesus as God, the New Testament use of theos in reference to Jesus. Let me get you the link from Amazon. Dr. Murray J. Harris is one of the top evangelical Trinitarian scholars, one of the best theologian scholars and apologists, affirming the Trinity, that Jesus is the God-man. And also, he wrote an excellent book called Three Questions on Jesus, right? Providing historical proof for the resurrection of Jesus and providing a solid <clears throat> case for Jesus being the God man. Three questions about Jesus. Let me get you his books. You need to get both. Murray J. Harris. He's also written some excellent commentaries. Okay. Let me get you the book. Link to his books on Amazon. And as you go through it, you'll see the list of his books. These two books greatly help me understand the prologue of John and the Greek. 
God used these two books, Jesus as God and the Forgotten Trinity by Murray J. Harris and James White to help me understand the Gospel of John with greater depth, <clears throat> with greater meaning. Another book that helped me. Now, here's that. That's the link to Murray J. Harris. Click on it. You're going to see he has a lot of books. He's got commentaries on the Gospel of John, on Colossians, on Corinthians. But as you scroll down, you're going to find his book on Jesus as God. Let me get it for you. Because you got to go all the way down, right? Let me get it for you. Here's the book I was talking about. Three cru crucial questions about Jesus. You have to get this book. It is an overall defense of the resurrection of Jesus, showing that it's a fact of history. Jesus has been raised. He's alive. And a section on Jesus' <clears throat> deity going through the New Testament, showing that the New Testament identifies Jesus as God in the flesh. Short book full of meat. Three crucial questions about Jesus. But the one book that I want you to get along with this one is Murray J. Harris's book, Jesus as God. Let me get it for you. Guys, just bear with me because I want to give you these resources if you want to probe further into these discussions. Come on, man. Let me just go back and let me just do Jesus as God, Murray J. Harris, even simpler. Sorry about that, guys. Just don't, don't stone me. Bear with me. This is all to prepare you, whet your appetites for what's to come. And I'm going to give you some articles I wrote on John, right? Here it goes. It's right in front of my eyes. I didn't even see it. Jesus as God. Here you go, folks. There you go. That's the one. Jesus as God, the New Testament use of theos in reference to Jesus. That is the standard work used in colleges and seminaries when professors want to introduce their students to the subject of the deity of Christ and how many times the New Testament calls Jesus God, the Greek word theos. He has a section on John's prologue. Excellent. Now, here's the third book that God used to help me. So an autodidact is someone who's self-taught, meaning he doesn't have a human teacher discipling him, right? Hasn't gone to college or seminary, but studies by the grace of God's spirit, various literatures, various literature, various books, various sources, and is trusting in the Holy Spirit to guide him into all truth and to save him from error, right? Okay, now let me give you the other book that really blessed me by the grace of God. Robert Bowman Jr. is also one of the top evangelical scholars, one of the leading Trinitarian scholars and apologists, written excellent books on Joe's Witnesses and Mormons and others. Okay? He wrote a superb book on the Gospel of John. Specifically, on John chapter 1, John 8, 58, and John 20, 28. He wrote a book just on John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, John chapter 8, verse 58, and John 20, verse 28, in response to Joe's Witnesses. And here it is. Save the links. Study the material. Here it is. The name of the book, The Joe's Witnesses, Jesus Christ and the Gospel of John. The Joe's Witnesses, Jesus Christ and the Gospel of John. This book helped me tremendously. He made Greek grammar so simple that even a kindergarten student could understand Greek grammar. God used this book and this man to help me understand Greek grammar so adequately that I'm able now to engage Joe's witnesses or those who think they know the Greek of John on their level without having to go to seminary or college to do so. Okay, did you get it? Did you save these links? I'm giving you books that you can read. Now I'm going to give you articles. Yes, Lisa, either first, last, or Protestant will put the links in the description box. So thank them for helping me beatify the page. Then They don't get paid for this. Their reward is with Jesus. Now, here's my article. If you guys don't want to get the books, that's okay. Save money and send me the money because I can use the money for ministry. So all that money you save on books, send it to me. Send it to my favorite charity, me and my children. <laughs> hey, it's not funny, okay? Stop laughing. Here it goes. 
Here is an entire article I wrote on the Greek grammar of John chapter 1, verse 1 in response to a Muslim. Here you go. Here it is. That article is my thorough exegesis of John 1, 1, in response to a Muslim. And there I quote James White, Murray J. Harris, and others. Okay? Let me give you the link again. That's the link. And... Yesterday, I published a new post on my blog, more proof from the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible that Jesus is Jehovah. Here's the link. More proof from the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible that Jesus is Jehovah. What you can do is you go to my blog in the search engine, post Jehovah's Witnesses or post the New World Translation. I have over half a dozen articles on Jehovah's Witnesses on my blog. So here's the link. Okay, I hope I gave you enough resources to study at your own leisure. Because with all that said, are we ready now to break down John chapter 1, verses 1 of 5 and verse 14? That's what I'm going to focus on for this session. John 1, verses 1 of 5 and verse 14, by the grace of the triune God. Are we ready? Are you in the saddle? And this time we're not going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. We're not going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Uh, Miron, thank the triune God, thank the Lord Jesus for his grace, his blessing, his mercy, and compassion for raising up human teachers and equipping them to equip you. I wouldn't know this, right? I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have these materials unless the Lord Jesus put in my heart and set me apart to do this for his glory and to bless his church. Okay? Now, we're going to use... For the most part, I believe we're going to, what do you want to use? Modern English version or King James? Uh, Tituin. Hold on, Tituin. Let me stop the, the discussion. My, my precious brother whom I love. And let's talk about Matthew 13, 58. Why? Why are we like this? Why do we struggle with flesh, fleshly sinful desires and succumb? And why can't we focus on a subject? And why do we go on tangents? Save us from ourselves. Okay, King James Version it is. King James Version it is. We're going to use the King James Version. And we're going to look at the Greek interlinear. Greek interlinear. Well, not the Greek interlinear of the Jehovah's Witnesses. We're going to use the Greek interlinear of BibleHut.com. One of the best online sources on the Bible and Various versions for free. So here's the link to the Greek interlinear. Okay, let's begin. Let's start with John 1 verses 1 and 2. Yep, I'm going to block myself. Thank God we have a good crowd. Hopefully we can get 200 in a matter of a week in Jesus' name. Okay, John 1 verses 1 and 2. Send Sam to Nineveh. Let's begin. Even your name is hard to pronounce. Let's start it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All the information I'm going to give you are in the articles that I gave you and in the books. And I'm going to keep it simple. It's going to be so clear that you're going to think you're a Greek scholar. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be so clear to understand you're like, you're going to say, wow. The same was in the beginning with God. And you won't even need to know the Greek to still make your point. Now, in the beginning was the Word. Let's break down in the beginning. If you remember from yesterday's session, I said, in the beginning, especially the Greek, in Arche, here's the link to the Greek. In Arche, and means in, it can also mean by. Arche, Arche, beginning, is the same way, is the same way that the Greek translation of Genesis 1-1 begins. So that's the first point I want you to note. John's gospel begins with the opening words of the Greek version of Genesis 1. Now, why is that important? Since John is writing in Greek, that means he's writing to a Greek audience who reads Greek. That means that Greek audience would be reading the Old Testament in Greek. You with me there? And so so uh, someone who knows the Old Testament in Greek and has read John in Genesis 1 would automatically, immediately make the connection with John 1.1 and Genesis 1.1. He said, oh, 
John is now giving us an inspired exposition of Genesis 1 to show us where Jesus appears in Genesis 1. Now, don't take my word for it. Thank God for modern technology. Here you go. The English translation of the Greek version. And side note, you have Orthodox Christians here with us, Netta and Anna Groin. The Orthodox Church only follows the Greek version of the Old Testament. They do not follow the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. They don't use the Hebrew. They only use the Greek version of the Old Testament. Did you guys know that? Did you know that? Now you do. Now, if you ask the, the Orthodox churches specifically, why do you only follow the Greek version of the Old Testament? See, Orthoroko is right here, an Orthodox brother in Christ, Trinitarian who loves Jesus. Because they'll tell you that was the Bible of the Greek-speaking churches, right? Since the apostles preached the gospel to all nations, the lingua franca, the language of the people at the time was Greek because of Alexander the Great, great Hellenizing the world. So Greek became the language of the world, the known world. So when the apostles wanted to reach the nations, they wrote in the language that everyone could read, Greek. Like today, if I want to reach Hispanic people, Russian people, if I want to reach Middle Eastern people in the West, I write in English. So at that time, if you wanted to reach the nations, they all had to know Greek. And guess what the Jews did before the New Testament was written in Greek? The Jews translated the Old Testament into Greek for the Diaspora Jews, the Alexandrian Jews, those Jews who were scattered because of the Babylonian captivity and did not return to their homeland, who could no longer read or write Hebrew, Aramaic, but only Greek. So they provided the translation of the Old Testament in Greek for those Jews so they wouldn't lose their religious identity. You getting it? So if you're a Greek speaker and you're reading the New Testament Greek, guess what version of the Old Testament you're going to read? The Greek. So the Greek Orthodox Church has made it its tradition to only follow the Greek version of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint. Even the word Septuagint, it's Latin, Septuaginta. Septuaginta means the translation of the 70. Because early tradition says a group of 70 Jews before the time of Christ, around the 3rd century B.C., about 300 years before the birth of Christ, 70 Jews went home and independently translated the five books of, of Moses into Greek, and when they compared, it was virtually identical, which they took to be a miracle. So, so the Septuaginta means the translation of the 70. What 70? Tradition says 70 Jews translated the five books of the Old Testament into Greek. Clear? And a lot of people don't know that in the second century after Christ, this is something a lot of people don't know, you had three individuals, Simachus, Aquila, Theodosian, two of whom were apostates from Christianity. They left Christianity and embraced Judaism. That also translated the Old Testament into Greek in the second century after Christ. Did you know that? That's why, for you careful readers who read the footnotes to your Bibles, that's why you sometimes see a note saying Semachos or Theodosian or Aquila. This is referring to the Greek version of the Old Testament produced by three of these men, two of whom were apostates from Christianity. And Origen, Origen in the early 3rd century, consulted their versions of, of the Old Testament into Greek in making what he called the hexapla. Hexapla. Hexapla was six versions of the Old Testament that Origen compiled. The Septuagint, the three Greek versions of these men, Hebrew, and I don't recall, I think another one in Latin. Don't quote me on that, but there were six versions of the Old Testament that he collated and combined called the hexapla. Lord, forgive me for any error and protect me from that, right? Clear? Everyone with me so far? Or did I lose you with this detail? 
What was the point bringing out the detail? John is writing in Greek. His audience read Greek. That means they would be familiar with the Greek version of the Old Testament, which is why till this day the Orthodox Church only goes with the Greek version. So when they translate the Old Testament into English, they do not consult the Hebrew or Aramaic. They only consult the Greek version of the Old Testament. And you have Orthodox Christians here. Am I lying, guys? Anna, Nada, Ortharoko. Am I lying? Just want to make sure. I want you to hear from them. Everything fascinating, good, is from the triune God. He gets the glory. Okay? Right? And they'll tell you, why would I want to use the Hebrew version when the Greek church, Greek-speaking churches, use the Greek version? And now the church is the true spiritual Israel of God. Ortharoko. Anything good, God gets the glory. All good from our triune God. Everything wrong and mistaken comes from first and last. We'll blame him. But you're going to be stuff you're going to disagree with me, but we can agree to disagree and still be brothers as long as you worship the Trinity and worship Jesus Christ, my God and Savior. Okay, anyway, with that as a background, that as a background, someone reading John in Greek and he sees the words en arche or en arche would immediately connect it with the Greek version of Genesis 1. Here's the link to Genesis 1, the English translation of Genesis 1. English translation of the Greek of Genesis 1. The English translation of Genesis 1 from Greek. Guys, when you click there, when you look to the right, you're going to see these two words. When you look to the right, you're going to see these two words. En arche, the same two words of John 1.1. 1, 1. How do you transliterate that? En arche or arche. Okay, everyone, see, John 1.1 1, 1 begins the same way that the Greek version of Genesis 1.1 1, 1 begins. Everyone see that before I move on to the next point? Come on, guys, we've got 136. I want to hear 136 likes. We already got three people disliking me, those Mohammedans, anti-Trinitarians who can't stand me. Okay, if you see that, what's the point? John is trying to tell you, let me show you where Jesus was when God created the heavens and the earth. When Genesis 1 mentions creation of heaven and the earth, let me show you the role that Jesus plays played in that creation. You understand what John wanted to tell us? John wanted to tell us, here's where Jesus fits in the Genesis 1 account of creation. Let me show you what Jesus was doing when creation came into being according to Genesis 1. Because Genesis 1 is the inspired account of how God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. So John is saying, I'm going to take you back to the Genesis account of creation, and I'm going to show you where our Lord Jesus was in that account and what role he played. Clear? You understand the point of John 1? So what does he say? In the beginning... Was the word. Ah, here you're going to feel like Greek scholars. And thank those men of God whom the Lord used to sharpen me as he's using me to sharpen you. We build on those who came before us and we learn from them. Okay. That Greek verb was. Go back to John 1. Okay. When you look at the link that I gave you, here it is. I want you to look at the English word was there. And this is all in my article, by the way. Here it says, en arche, I'm going to give your ask me pronunci pronunciation, en halogos, or some will say, o logos, o logos, tikanis ere, o logos ere, anyway, do you see the word was? Do you see it? You see it's transliterated as in. Now some will put two e's to distinguish it from the first n. Okay. Do you see that word, ain? Was? Ain? Okay. This is what is known, and you can just look at the bottom, it'll tell you. This is what is known as the imperfect tense of aimi. 
The verb aimi is the Greek word for being. Okay? This is the imperfect tense form of aimi. What does that mean? Guys, I need you to pay attention. What does the imperfect tense form mean? The imperfect tense of the present tense verb aimi. The imperfect tense refers to continuous past action. An action that extends into the past. Okay? Here's where I'm going to go very slow to get it. So you guys get it. The imperfect tense means it's an action that <clears throat> goes back into the past. It's an action <clears throat> that continues into the past, that goes back into the past. So it's called continuous past action. No, not an incompleted past action. No, Jonathan Simon. Imperfect means it's not... Well, when you say incomplete, uh, I understand what you mean now. Someone's going to think that it's incomplete, therefore it's lacking something. That's not what we mean by incomplete. It, imperfect tense means it's an action that's continuous but doesn't have an end point. It's ongoing, continuous action in the past that doesn't have an end point unless the context shows you the end point or the beginning point of that action. Okay, so not to confuse you. Now I understood what you meant by inc incomplete past, Jonathan. Because when you say incomplete, you mean to lack something. See, in our English language, incomplete means lacking something. This is where I get this discombobulated when you guys chime in. I read your comments and you shut me down. I digress and have to then regroup. It's okay, Jonathan. I'll forgive you for that. But if I see you close to close, I'll lay hands on you. All right. Let me again repeat what the imperfect tense means. Imperfect tense means an action... In the past, it's an action that goes into the past. How far into the past, the context will have to determine. You with me there? Did I confuse you what that verb means? It means continuous action in the past. Continuous past action. An action that goes back into the past. And where did it start in the past? The context has to tell you. If someone didn't get this point, let me know. Because this is the key point in unlocking John 1. If you don't get it, I can't move on. So let me give you a paraphrase of John 1.1. 1, 1. This is what John 1.1 1, 1 would be saying to a Greek reader. Greek reader. In the beginning, the word was already existing. The word was already existing. You with it? That's that's the implication, the import of the imperfect tense. In the beginning, the word was already existing. Who's not getting it? Anonymous, Lopez is a brother in Christ who serves the triumph God. Let's respect one another for the sake of Jesus. He's not an enemy. He's got a ministry serving Jesus, him and his wife. Let's bless them because they're servants of the Lord. No need to attack believers. If he's an unbeliever or a heretic or a troublemaker, that's one thing. He's your brother in Christ. He's a Trinitarian. He's a minister of the gospel. Sorry for the noise outside. It's Saturday. Okay. Folks, if you don't get this point, I can't move on. Honestly, I can't because then this is this this verb is the key to unlocking the beauty, the depth, the majesty of John's prologue. Why James White called it a masterpiece. It truly is a masterpiece, and it shows it's inspired by God. So understand when John says in the beginning was the word, the verb was literally means in the beginning, the word was already existing. Meaning when the beginning began, he was already existing. Did we get that point? No, not existing eternally, Medic. See, you're jumping the gun, and I can show you where the imperfect tense is used, and it doesn't mean eternally. It means an action in the past but had a starting point. Because you're jumping the gun, Medic, you're going to make it harder for me. I challenge you, Medic, to show me any lexical source that says the imperfect tense refers to eternal past existence. 
It doesn't mean that. Can you stop helping me, brother? Imperfect tense simply means an action in the past. And the context will determine where the beginning point of that action started. So you're wrong when you say eternal past existence. No, the imperfect tense doesn't convey that meaning. You're wrong, brother. Don't give misinformation. Lest someone who knows the Greek then turns and says, you're wrong. Here's an imperfect tense used here, and it had a beginning point in the past. Can you not help me so I can help you and not distract? Keep what your friend told you to yourself till the end because we're on a topic. Okay. Notice the distractions we have from two of these, two of these guys. Paulo wants me to talk about Sabbath, and Marcus wants me to read a book because his friend recommended it to him. Can you believe the audacity of these guys? Okay. Did you understand? Because Medic confused us by that comment. Do you guys understand the imperfect tense doesn't mean eternal past existence? That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that. Don't make that mistake in saying because someone who's a scholar of the Greek language will embarrass you and say, here are examples of the imperfect tense where the actions have passed, but it had a beginning point. Where are you confused, Lisa? See, this is why I don't want people to chime in. And no matter how many times I tell my brother, Medic, and I love him for the sake of the Lord, and he has a fire for the Lord, he can't control himself. He has to comment. Wow, man. How many times do I have to keep telling this brother? Lisa, where are you confused? God bless you too and what? And I'm being only impatient, Paolo, because I don't want to distract other people when you chime in and make statements that are not true to confuse them, then I have to correct it. And they'll say, there's no love in Sam. He's always harsh. Okay. Lisa, where are you confused? Can you quickly respond? Because I don't want to waste time and drag. Please. I want to help you understand, but you got to be quick in responding. Okay. Lisa, come on, sister. You got to speed up, please. I, I don't want to take too much time. Keep praying for my, my legal self and kids. Yeah. Forget what he said, Lisa. What he said was wrong, and he shouldn't have said anything. This is what I was trying to avoid, confusion. Lisa, let me repeat what the imperfect tense means. It means action that continues in the past. That's all it means. It doesn't mean action that's eternal. It goes all the way into eternity. If Medic chimes in again, he's going to leave me no choice but to block him. Sorry, Medic. You got to stop, brother. Please help me to help you. Okay, now at least you understand the imperfect text simply means this action goes back into the past. How far into the past? You're going to have to read the context to show how far in the past. The context may show you this action goes into the past up until that point. That's the point where it started. Right? Lisa? The imperfect tense doesn't mean eternal past action. It simply means an action that <clears throat> continues into the past, meaning it goes back into the past. That's all it means. Okay. If you understood that part, Lisa, let me now again give you the nuance of John 1.1. 1, 1. This is what John 1.1 1, 1 literally means. In the beginning, the word was already existing. Now, the question is, if he was already existing, how far do you extend his existence in the past? Was he existing eternally? Or, though he was existing before the beginning, his existence had a starting point? That's the question I want to answer. So what we get thus far is the word was already existing before the beginning. Now, does that mean since he was already existing before the beginning, 
he was ex existing eternally, or he was existing before the beginning, but his existence had a starting point. You understand now what I want to answer? Now we're going to answer that question. Now we're going to answer that question. Was Jesus' existence before the beginning eternal? Or, though he was existing before the beginning, his existence did have a starting point. That's what we have to determine from the context. So, imperfect tense doesn't tell you whether that past action had a start or it's eternally ongoing. That you have to derive from something in the context. Now, how do I answer this? First, let me give you a paraphrase of John 1.1. 1 .1. In the beginning, the word was already existing. He was existing with God and was existing as God. So question, if he was already existing and already existing with God and already existing as God before the beginning, was that existence eternal or did it have a starting point? That's what I'm trying to answer. Now let's read John 1, 2 to, 2 to 4 for the answer. So I love you, medic. Be patient. Don't chime in. Listen, brother, for your benefit. John 1, 2 to 4. 2 to 4. Listen. Help me to help you so I don't confuse people, brother. Okay? Don't make the Greek say more than it is. More than it says. John 1, 2 to 4. The same was in the beginning with God. Literally, the same was already existing in the beginning with God. That's the same verb, aim, the perfect tense of aimee. So now, question. John, we got the fact that you're saying the word was already existing in the past before the beginning. How far into the past was he existing? His existence. How continuously in the past was it? Did it have a beginning point or was it eternal, ongoing? No beginning. And John says, read verses 3 and 4. Come on. Sorry, guys. Even though it's better connection, we still buffer here. Notice when it buffered, right when I was going to say, John. How continuously in the past was this existence? So we get the fact of saying before the beginning, the word was already existing. His existence was continuous in the past. How far into the past? Never ending past or did it have a beginning? And John says, here's your answer. John 1, 3 to 4. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And here's the answer. He says... He was existing before the entire creation came into being. He was existing before creation. But John, before creation, you have eternity. Before creation, you have timelessness. Before creation, you have only God. Because God is eternal and nothing existed in eternity except God. But you just said the word was already existing before creation came into being. Well, before creation, John, you have timelessness, eternity. So John says, that's my point. He's always been in existence. He's always <clears throat> been existing with God and always been existing with, with God as God, always existing in eternity because his existence is timeless and eternal. That's the answer. That's how I know, that's how I know that John is saying Jesus' existence in the past is ongoing, never ending, having no beginning in eternity. He was existing in eternity. He was existing in eternity. Before there was time, before there was space, before there was place, before creation existed, he was already existing in eternity with God the Father. That's what John's Greek is saying. So that's how you prove Jesus' eternal past existence. 
not from the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense doesn't tell you how long that existence extends in the past. All the imperfect tense tells you that action go, goes into the past. That's all it says. This is an action that stretches into the past, but it doesn't tell you how far into the past it extends. I'm trying to make the Greek as simple as possible. Did everyone get it now? So here's the question. Here's the question. Please, Father, bless the connection in Jesus' name. Here's the question. So John tells us the word was already existing before creation. That means this is an action, an existence that stretches into the past. How far into the past did this existence extend, and how do we know? And John tells you, my answer is in verses 3 and 4. He was already in existence, already existing, before all creation came into being. Well, what do you have before all creation? Timelessness, eternity. That means there was no point in time when the sun's existence began. Thank you, Andrew. Okay? Now, let me tell you how the Joe's Witnesses get around it. Let me tell you how the Joe's Witnesses get around it. You know what they'll tell you? This is their answer. Let's look at John 1, 3 again. Guys, if you understand this point of grammar, John 1 becomes the greatest nightmare to anti-Trinitarians, decimating, abolishing their blasphemous heresy, a lie, and assault against the Trinity. If you just understand these few simple grammatical <clears throat> rules. Now, let me tell you how the Jehovah's Witness will get around this. All things were made by him, and what, without him was not anything made that was made. This is how they're going to get around this. Here's what I want you to be prepared for, for their counter response. They'll say, John is not talking about the creation of all things. All things here means the creation of Genesis 1. And they'll tell you Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the physical universe. It's simply saying Jesus existed before the physical universe. Physical space, sky, and the earth. But it's not saying he existed before all creation because Genesis is not talking about all creation. It's not talking about that spiritual dimension called heaven. Genesis is simply talking about the physical universe that Jesus was already there before the physical universe was created, so were the angels. Do you understand how they try to get around it? You understand how they try to get around it? Now, are you ready to decimate that objection? Are you ready to show, no, Genesis 1 is not just talking about physical creation. Genesis 1 is talking about all creation, even the spiritual Dimension called heaven and angels. It's not about every created thing. That's what Genesis 1 is talking about. You cannot limit it simply to physical creation. Here's how you destroy their argument. Genesis 1-1 with Genesis 2 verse 1. Are you guys now ready to destroy that argument to show Genesis 1 is talking about all creation, the entire creation, every created thing, spiritual heaven, physical heaven, angels and humans and everything. Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 2 1. Watch. If you get these points, John 1 is a nightmare and one of the most powerful chapters written by the Triune God and confirming two divine persons eternally existing together, being the creator of all things. Here, Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 2 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What heaven and earth did he create? Genesis 2.1 tells you. Pay attention to the key word host. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. That's where you need to zero in. That word host. All the host of the heavens, all the hosts of the earth were created in Genesis 1. Not some. All the host of the heavens Shemaim, plural, heavens, all their hosts, and all the hosts of the earth. Now, how does this prove that Genesis 1 is talking about the creation 
of every created thing, even angels and the spiritual dimension called heaven. How does that prove that? Let's go to Psalm 103, 20 to 21. What does the word host, especially host of heaven, refer to? Psalm 103, 20 to 21. Watch here. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the word of his word, uh, the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Did you catch it? Hosts are angels. Angels are the hosts. So the host of heavens means angels as well as the stars and the moon and the sun. It's all included. Do you see it? Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. Yep. Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. You see how deep and rich and beautiful and irrefutable our Bible is? You didn't post Psalm 148, verse 1, Protestant. You posted Psalm 103, 21. Your amnesia is kicking in, old man. Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. That's what happens when you get old like Protestant. Remember, he's been pro protesting from the 16th century. So he's about, what, 400 years old. Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. Pay attention. Praise ye the Lord Jehovah. Praise ye the Lord Jehovah from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Notice heavens now. It's not about heavens here. From the heavens. Who are in the heavens? Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Bam. Who are in the heavens? The hosts of God who are the angels. Did you catch it? Praise ye all you from the heavens. Who are in the heavens? His angels who are his hosts. Do you see that? Uh, time A, let me change the subject because you want me to refute Bart Ehrman because you're a silly, arrogant <clears throat> jerk who thinks it's all about you because our topic isn't important, right? Do you guys see it? Psalm 148, verse 1 and 2, even Jonathan's excited. He went to 1 Kings twenty two nineteen, 19, which I mentioned yesterday because he mentioned it. I'm not going to mention that because he mentioned it. All right, one more time. Psalm 148, verses 1 and 2. Patience, Jonathan. I know you need attention with medic, and I'll give you attention afterwards. I'll, I'll sing for you. Psalm 148, verse 1 and 2, one more time. Praise ye, Jehovah. Praise ye, Jehovah, from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. So who are in the heavens that praise Jehovah? Answer, praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. The angels of heaven are the hosts of heaven. The hosts of heaven are the angels of heaven. So when Genesis 2.1 says, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth and all their hosts. That means Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of every creature. The spiritual dimension called heaven, the angels that dwell there, their hosts, and everything else. Genesis 1 is not simply about the physical creation. It's the creation of the entire creation. Every created thing, including angels and their abode, their spiritual abode called heaven. Now, since Jonathan gave me 1 Kings 22, 19... I'm not going to quote that. I'm going to give the parallel. 2 Chronicles 18, verses 18 to 22. 2 Chronicles 18, verses 18 to 22. Watch here. Who are the hosts of heaven? Watch here. 2 Chronicles 18, verses 18 to 22. Again, he said, therefore, hear the word of Jehovah. The peril to 1 Kings 22. The Lord, I saw Jehovah the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven. Guys, catch it. All the host of heaven standing on his right and on his left. This right here, if there, if if the rest of the passages didn't convince you that the host of heaven mean the angelic creatures, spirit creatures that dwell in heaven before God, where God appears visibly on his throne, here you go. So when Genesis 2.1 says, God finished creating the heavens and all their hosts, 
That is proof that Genesis 1 is not about the creation of every created thing, not just the physical universe. Okay, let's continue reading. The host of heaven standing on his right and on his left. And Jehovah said, the Lord said, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramath Gilead? And one spake, saying, after this manner, and another saying, after that manner. Then there came out a spirit. See, the host of heaven, they speak. They communicate. They are aware they, they exist and Jehovah exists and he's their God on the throne. And here we're told, a spirit. So the host of heaven are the spirit creatures standing in tension before Jehovah. I don't need to read the rest of it. Any more proof? Any more proof? Miro, let me just repeat what I rep repeated yesterday. Early on when I started uh, ministering and doing ministry, I realized, Miron, because I want to answer this. I want you to see how real, how amazing, how awesome our triune God is. I'm a wicked sinner who fails him daily to my shame. May Jesus crucify my flesh and be patient with me and not destroy me and give me what I deserve, but make me holy unto the Lord and in love with Jesus. I really need victory to be a doer, not just a speaker of his word. As I started teaching doing mystery, I realized that when you'd ask me a question, verses would pop pop in my head. So no matter what the subject is, by the grace of Jesus, the verses would come. Right? I don't know if I had it as a kid. Because remember, even a gift that's from the Spirit, right, is something that you can have when you're born. When you're born. But then the spirit cultivates that gift and perfects it and brings you to faith to then use it. It's like a singing voice. Is someone born with a with the ability to sing? Yes. Who gave him that ability to sing? God. But what will he do with that gift? Will he then use it to honor God or use it to bring himself fame, fortune, and rob God of the glory for giving him that gift? Like Michael Jackson. He was gifted. That voice was from God. Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Bruce Lee, anyone who excels in a field, even fighting, folks, if you don't believe me, just read the book of Samuel. You'll see that God praises these outstanding men of valor, mighty soldiers who are mighty in the battlefield, who did things in the battlefield that were amazing, if not miraculous. And they're praised for it because even your ability to fight physically even your ability to conquer armies, that too is a gift. Your ability to fight in the ring, that's a gift. Your ability to sing, that's a gift. Anything you excel in, that's a gift from God. The question is, will you use that gift to honor him or rob him of glory and either glorify yourself or a false god? So God had gifted me with the ability of recall and perfected it in me to use it for ministry. And again, I say this because I want you to see how real God is in our lives, how real he's been in my life. No high school diploma, a GED, no college, no seminary. Solely and strictly the triune God being pleased to set me apart and guide me to the resources and enable me to separate wheat from the chaff for the glory of Jesus. Okay? And I want to say this again. Again, God save me. I'm not trying to bring it. Lord, I'm trying to glorify you and sanctify my heart. Because I want you to see, if God can do this in me, then what can he do in you if you believe and trust and yield? He is almighty in you as he's in me. Okay? Even, even reading the Greek New Testament... I'm able to read the Greek New Testament. doesn't mean I can translate it or understand everything. You know how I learned reading the Greek New Testament? I just want to take a moment to give God the glory because you mentioned this. You know who helped me learn the Greek New Testament? The Joe's Witnesses. Because I went to their kingdom hall and I picked up their hard copy of the Greek interlinear New Testament. And I opened up to the front cover and I looked at the Greek words and their English equivalent. And by then learning that, let's say, Alpha meant A, I then started reading the Greek. Do you know that? God is my witness, not lying. 
So the Jehovah Witness interlinear helped me by the grace of God's spirit to learn the Greek New Testament. No one taught me the Greek New Testament. Now, that doesn't mean I understand the grammar or I can translate everything. I can read it. Thank you, Anna. This should move you to be in awe of how real God is. He is real. He is life. How much he loves us and that Jesus is in us. And if you trust, he can do it in and through you. And that's why you're here. Why are you here? Because God saw your heart. God, I want to know your word. So he raised up the teachers to teach you so you can learn this stuff. You can absorb it and share it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Miron, you don't get stupider than me. Jason, you don't get stupider than me. No formal education. Trust God. He is almighty and wisdom is from him. He will do this through you if you believe. That's why I'm sharing this testimony. I'm not smarter than you. I'm not better than you. I am not. In fact, my struggles of the flesh, shame on me. May God save me from myself. But if he can do it through me, Jason, Marone, you know your God is real and almighty to save. And he's in love with you and loves you just as much as he loves me. And he'll do it for you and through you for the glory of Christ. Okay? Let me encourage you, not discourage you. Why is it discouraging you? I'm saying here is a moron, stupid person by worldly standards. No high school diploma, no college, no seminary. If God can do it through me, what can he do through you? So why is it discouraging? That's your, wow, how real are you, Holy Spirit? Fill me now because I want to be sold out for Jesus. And he'll do it. He'll do it, man. I should encourage you. And some of you are better educated than me. So if God can do it through a moron like me, what do you think he's going to do through you? Remember, the same Jesus that loves me is in love with me. He loves and adores every one of you. He's in love with you. But he just wants you to trust. He wants you to trust. And that's what he's been teaching me two years. That I trust him. He'll keep me safe for his glory and deal with that wicked, corrupt, demonic judge and silence her. Keep her away from me and save my children in Jesus' name. Okay? No, medic. You're not the dumbest guy. You are precious to Jesus. Jesus loves you and adores you. And he's working through you for his glory. And I, I thank God that he's using me in, in your life to bless you and even sometimes to discipline you out of love. Now, with that said, exactly, Andrew. With that said, coming back to the issue, what creation is Genesis 1 referring to? What creation is Genesis 1 referring to? Is it just the physical universe or is it the entire creation, the creation of every created thing, even the spiritual dimension called heaven and the angels in it? So if a Jehovah Witness tells you, no, 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 John was talking about the physical creation because it's referring to Genesis 1, and Genesis 1 is talking about the physical creation. So yes, Jesus was already existing before physical creation. You now know how to refute it. Say, no, 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 no. Genesis 2.1 refutes you because Genesis 2.1 concludes Genesis 1 by saying, and God created the heavens and the earth and all their hosts. All the heavens and all their hosts, that includes the spiritual dimension called heaven and the angelic hosts that dwell there. It's talking about all creation. Live with it. You can't get around it. So now, Joe, witness, you're stuck. You're stuck. Because now let's go to John 1, 3 to 4, Jehovah Witness. Jeremiah, you have my permission to take all my articles on my blogs, translate them in Spanish for your blog, and take my videos and put in Spanish subtitles and chop them down into smaller segments for the glory of the triune God. Jeremiah, don't ask me, do it. This is for the body of Christ, all of you. Guys, let me say it again. You have permission. Take all my stuff, translate it in any language for the glory of Jesus. You don't need to ask me because this is not my wisdom. It's God's wisdom given through me for the church. Okay? Yeah, what do you mean, really? Of course. 
But one thing I don't want you to do, sell the material and make money off of it because I make it available for free. If someone wants to donate to my ministry, I would need that to do ministry, but you're not obligated to. Okay? Freely you receive, freely you shall give. So now John 1, 3 to 4. John 1, 3 to 4. Let me repeat. You don't need to ask me, any one of you, to download or upload my videos, my articles, and even translate them or put subtitles for your YouTube channels or your, your websites. Do it for the glory of China God. Translate them. Do it. In fact, I'd appreciate it people downloaded my videos to their YouTube channel because I'm expecting that in due course, they'll even probably block my channel. The way it's going, YouTube's going to censor every one of us. God bless you too, Magdalene. What a nice name, Magdalene. Right? Mary Magdalene. God bless you, sister, and watch over you. All right. With that said, with that said, Let's go back to John 1, 3 to 4. John 1, 3 to 4. That's why I wore a friend's shirt. Forget that wicked TV show. Wicked, promoting immorality. I wore this shirt to show you you're my friends because you love Jesus. Okay? John 1, 3 to 4. Now let's understand the use of the imperfect tense. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And it was life, and the life was the light of men. So now, guys, let's recap so you don't forget the point. Okay? You hear what Protestant believers said? Darn! How many times am I going to have to post this verses before you read? Protestant, I see you on Discord. Sinner, gossiping sinner. Okay. All things were made by him, and without him... Was not anything made that was made. Okay, guys. Since John 1 is echoing the Genesis 1 account of creation. Okay. And Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of every created thing. All the heavens, even spiritual heaven. All creatures that live in heaven and on earth. Angels and human. What more proof do you want that John 1 is saying that the word was already existing before the whole of creation came into being. Is that clear? So when it says in the beginning was the word, the Greek verb was means continuous action in the past, an action that extends into the past. How far into the past? John 1, 3 tells us. Jesus was already existing in the past before all creation. But John, one second. Before all creation, you have eternity. Before all creation, you have timelessness because time, space, place came into being when God brought all creation into existence. So, John, are you saying that this word was eternally existing when he was existing in the past before creation? Before creation, he was already in eternity. Therefore, he's eternal like God the Father. So the word has no beginning. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. So wait, John. You're saying there were at least two divine persons, the Word and the God with whom he was, God and his Word together, together before all creation in eternity? Yes. But here is where you destroy the Jehovah's Witness. How many gods existed in eternity, Jehovah's Witness? How many gods existed before all creation? How many gods are eternal? One. They'll tell you one, right? How many gods was already existing before all creation? One. How many gods eternally existed? Have existed eternally in the past? No beginning. One. You just destroyed your translation, Jehovah's Witness. Because your translation says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was a God. You can't have an a God existing in eternity. The only God that exists eternally is the true God. So even the context shows you have deliberately butchered the Greek. You can't have a God existing eternally. 
The only God that has existed eternally before creation is the true God. So there you have it, Jehovah's Witness. Your Bible is a satanic perversion. I don't care how much you try to appeal to Greek grammar and misinterpret Greek sources or scholarly sources of the Greek. You're stuck because if the word was the one that God used to create the entire creation, that means the word was already existing before all creation. And what do you have before all creation? Timelessness, eternity. And the only way the word could exist eternally is if he's God, not a God. But hold on, Jehovah's Witness. It says the word was with God. So there was someone else different from the word who was God. Yes. But the word was God. Yes. But there's only one God. Yes. So if the word was God eternally, and yet the word existed eternally with someone else who is God, so they're not the same person, but there's only one God. Joe Witness, you just helped me prove that the one true God is more than one person. It's the Father and his word, Jesus Christ the Son. You catching it? You're catching it? You know I'm going to have to do a part two on this, right? Because there's a lot more stuff I need to cover. I can't cover all in this session. So let me just wrap it up. A few more points. Lord willing, I should be back Tuesday because tomorrow is a busy day. And Monday, I got to move furniture into my apartment. So God willing, my furniture will be officially in the apartment Monday. And pray that that week I then get internet connection. So, but I have a big trial, February 19, a big trial. There Again, there's court for me, and I won't be there because I live in another state. I need you guys to covenant with me to pray and fast. God, do something that I judge and keep her away and deal with her and keep me safe here. And ask the Lord to hear the prayers of my daughters, that they'll be in my arms within a month or two, no light later, as God brings conviction to their mother to repent and fear the Lord. Now, some, let's wrap it up. John 1, 3 to 4. One more time. Let's wrap things up. I'm going to do a part two, God willing, by Tuesday, if not sooner. John 1, 3 to 4. One more time. Watch here. Okay. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now notice, in the word was life, meaning the life that creation receives in all forms, biological life. Spiritual life comes from the word. Did you catch it? In him, the word was life. Now notice it's using that imperfect tense, ain. In him, there was already life. Life was already in him. Life was continuously in him before creation. So if Jesus possessed life in himself before creation, he was already having life in himself before creation. At what point in time did Jesus receive life? He never received it. He always had it, right? If it says in him was life, and that verb again, meaning he already possessed life, he was having life in him before the beginning. That's before creation. That means Jesus possessed life in himself eternally he always had it you catching it you're catching it and it's that life that he possesses that gives life to all creation and illumination to all creation to find their way back to spiritual life in other words all biological life all plant life even the life of the stars and the sun and the moon, all marine life, even the life of the angels come from Jesus. He preserves them all. You with me there? But even that proves the point. The Joe Witness said, by means of him was life, meaning life came by him because of him. So their translation is just as powerful. 
Is that clear? Okay. And then it says, that life was the light of my meaning. He also gives us spiritual life. He gives us the spiritual illumination to enlighten us to find our way back to spiritual life. That's what it says. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, right? In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Meaning, not only does he give biological life or life to all physical creation, he gives us the illumination, enlightenment to find spiritual life, which comes from believing in him. But now let's put John 1, 4 and Psalm 36, 9 back to back. And we're going to end it with 14. Real brief, I have to do a part two. God willing, I have to do a part two. John 1, 4 with Psalm 36, verse 9. John 1, 4 and Psalm 36, verse 9. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Notice what the psalmist says of Jehovah. For with thee, Jehovah, is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. John, what are you doing describing the word Jesus in the way that the psalmist describes Jehovah? It says Jehovah is the fountain of life, John. Life comes from him. And it's his light that we see light. And the illumination we receive is from Jehovah's light. But John, you just said that about the word. Life is in the word, and it's the word that gives us light. Why are you saying this of the word, John? And this is only true of Jehovah, John. And John says, don't you get it? The word is Jehovah God, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, one with them in essence, nature, who became flesh. So who is this word? John 1.14. Well, the, yeah, the Jehovah Witness Bible reads similarly. Do me a favor, Protestant believer. Post the Jehovah Witness Bible of John 1.4. And Psalm 36.9 and Jehovah Witness Bible for Lopez. And we're done. Thank God we had about 160. Pray it increases, not decreases. Right? Psalm 36. John 1.4, Psalm 36.9 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Yeah, I'll take a few questions. I'll open up for a few minutes of Q&A right after this because I don't want to go further. I will do a part two, God willing. Joe Witness Bible Lopez. By means of him was life. See, life came through him because of him. And the life was the light of men. That's the Joe Witness Bible. Bam. Now notice the Joe Witness Bible, Psalm 36, 9. With you is the source of life. By your light, we can see light. You're in trouble, Joe Witness Bible. Exactly, Guy Wilkerson. If the anointed class of 144,000, the governing body, watches my sessions, they go, uh-oh, we got to come up with an update of the Bible. Right? We're going to have to change these passages because this bald, beastly, handsome Assyrian is destroying the governing body and he's not part of the anointed class. Right? John 1.14. And we'll unpack it. We'll do another session and unpack this. John 1.14. Okay. I even make coffee stained teeth look beautiful. I'm trying. I'm using, you know, uh, paste that whitens your teeth. We're going to have to probably use it for 50 more years. Sharky, don't tell us what your mother does with heads sticking up in aspirations. Anyway, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, and glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did you catch it? Who was that word that was already existing? Before the creation, already existing in fellowship with God and already existing as God in essence, by whom God the Father used to create the entire creation, creation of every created thing, the one who became Jesus of Nazareth. Now, guys, let's take a moment to blow your mind away. This is true history. We're not reading make-believe. We're not reading fantasy. We're not reading fiction. The Bible is an inspired revelation of the true historical acts of God, God's actions in time and space, the greatest of which is God becoming flesh. Guys, I want this to sink in if you believe what you just read. You just read Jesus Christ is the eternal, almighty word of God the Father, 
existing eternally, not a creature, who created everything in heaven and earth and gives life to the entire creation, and he became flesh, a true human being. He added the nature of humanity to himself and became a human being, one eternal divine person that became human. But now let me show you why you should be in awe. Jesus Christ is the only human being, man in history, who could say, I'm older than my parents. Even though he didn't have an earthly father, he only had a human mother. Still, Joseph was his adoptive legal father. In fact, I created them. And I gave them life. And I even chose who would be my mother. Jesus is the only man in history who could say, I created my own mother. I gave her life. I'm older than her. And I chose her to be my mother. Secondly, okay, did that sink in? I don't think I don't think it sunk in. Titus, you here? What's up, girlfriend? About time you came, right when I'm about to finish. Secondly, I want you to think about this. This, let it sink in. Secondly, about two thousand years ago, a young, pure, holy, virgin Jewish maiden. No man touched her sexually, conceived in her holy womb, consecrated by the Spirit, the physical body, the human nature of the eternal almighty word of the Father, the eternal almighty Son of God, her creator and the creator of all creation, who entered into that womb and tabernacled in her womb. So this woman for nine months carried the eternal creator who now was tabernacling in her womb to become a human baby. If that doesn't blow your mind away, I don't know what will. If that doesn't cause you to stand in awe of this beautiful virgin maiden who gave the eternal word, his human nature, to dwell among us, I don't know what will. Even as I think about it, I stand in awe. That beautiful, beloved, young Jewish virgin was the vehicle through whom my eternal God, my creator, my life giver, my love, my life, my savior became like me, human like me, to identify with me and to save me from my human wretchedness. Right? Do you see why? Do you see why? I said in a previous session, by the grace of Jesus, by his mercy and favor, by his righteousness, by his blood, saving me, I enter glory only because of what he did for me. And I bow before his feet, touch his feet, kiss his feet, though I'm not worthy to. And after I do that, I want to see the Apostle Paul and I want to see his mother. I want to look at this woman and stand in awe of her. And just look at her and say, how beautiful are you? How amazing are you that my God chose you to be his mother? And you carried my God in your womb. And you held my God in your arms. And you swaddled my God in his human nature as a human baby. And you held his hands and taught him how to walk. And you fed him. You cleansed him. You bathed him. And then... A mother's worst nightmare. You saw your baby boy as a grown man beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, spikes driven in his arms and his feet, hanging on a cross, gasping for air with a crown of thorns, and you beheld your beloved baby dying before your eyes and die. You know what that means, folks? <clears throat> Let me tell you what that means. <clears throat> yes, she is the Theotokos. <clears throat> the blessed Theotokos. <clears throat> you know what that means? When you stand before Jesus, when you stand before Jesus, you can't say you don't know what it's like to suffer. You don't know what it's like to lose a parent. You don't know what it's like to lose a child. You don't know what it's like to be betrayed. And the Lord will look at you and say, I don't. Not only did I choose this beloved woman to be my mother, I knew in choosing her 
I would have to allow her to see her son die a wretched death and pierce and break her heart. Don't tell me I don't know what it's like to have a parent lose a child because my mother lost me and I expired before her eyes, breaking her heart only to heal and restore it again three days later when I stood before her alive. Okay. Jesus knows your condition better than you think. He became man to identify with you, to tell you, I understand, I know, because I became one of you and I experienced what you experienced. I know your pain too well. That's why it says Jesus in heaven sympathizes with us. When he sees you crying, he cries. Folks, when you cry, he cries. And he looks at you and he says, I know your heart is broken. I too experienced a broken heart. My mother also experienced a broken heart. But trust me, at the end, I will make all things new. At the end, all of this will be forgotten and erased. At the end, you will dwell in my presence and I will flood you and drown you in my infinite love, in my infinite joy, in my infinite peace, and I promise you, you will never be heartbroken again. Just trust in me. Just trust in me. I will make all things new. Right? Lisa, may those words penetrate your heart. And Jesus says to you, Lisa, you haven't lost your son because your son is in my arms and I'm keeping him safe until you are re reunited with him. And Lisa, you're going to hear the words. Lisa, well done, good and faithful servant. Now you've entered my rest. And Lisa, you know what he's going to say to you and everyone else whose heart has been broken, who loves Jesus, who trusts in Jesus? You know what he's going to say? That's what he's going to say. Lisa, I have someone here who wants to see you. Behold your mother. Lisa, behold your son. And death will never separate you two ever again. Welcome home. Thank you, Jesus. All right, thank you. I'll take a question or two, and then we'll end the session. One question or two. Let's see. Amen. Where is your sting, death? Any questions? One or two. If not, we're going to end it with a verse. All right. Could you comment on Quran? No, I don't want to comment on Quran, uh, Hebrews 1.8. I don't want to talk about Islam when we're talking about the beautiful Jesus. Yes, she is. <laughs> You're going to make me cry, Anna Grong. Panagia, she is praying for me. I know. I believe it. They pray in heaven before the feet of Jesus. Right. Any questions? I don't want to talk about the Quran Islam. We just talked about how beautiful Jesus is. I want to keep it similar to the topic, glorifying the triune God. Learning how to exegete John 1 to prove that Jesus is eternal, almighty, different from the Father, but one, one with him in essence. John 1 is a masterpiece which proves that, that there are at least two eternal divine persons existing as God. Okay. If we're not, let me end with two verses, okay? Uh, he didn't say that, Tituan. You're falsely attributing words to Jesus that he did not say. And if you're referring to Mark 6, read it says he cannot do miracles because of their unbelief. It means it's not he couldn't do it. He didn't do it because he doesn't simply do miracles as a trick parlor. Okay? It's like when Paul says that he cannot speak to us because we are carnal. We are fleshly, not spiritual. That doesn't mean Paul couldn't speak. It means that you're not able to receive it. So that's not what Mark 6 says. Now, let's end it. Two verses. Psalm 27, verse 10. The promises of our Lord. Thank you, Alexander, for being here too. Psalm 27, verse 10. Let's read it. Okay. Psalm 27, verse 10. 
And I'm going to give you Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord Jehovah will take me up. I want you to have this verse etched in your hearts. If you've been abandoned by your parents, abandoned by your children, abandoned by a spouse, Jesus says, I will not abandon you. I will take you up to myself. Did you hear it? When my father and mother forsake me, then Jehovah the Lord will take me up. And now Isaiah 49, 15 to 16. Miss Titus, stop hurting me with those questions. You know it's definitely Jesus in the Old Testament. I got two sessions on my YouTube channel. Listen to it, and I got articles. Repent, sister, for being lazy and not searching it out. Face the east. Isaiah 49, 15 to 16. Isaiah 49, 15 to 16. Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Even a mother can abandon her child in a demonic rage, kill her children. Even a mother can sink that low to harm her own child. I cannot, I will not, and I will never do so. Because my love and compassion for you is infinitely greater than a mother's love and compassion. She may be able to do it. I will not, and I cannot. And then notice verse 16. Behold. I have graven thee on the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. You know what that means? That's Jesus saying, behold, I have graven you in the palms of my hands. When they nailed those spikes in the palms of my hands, or my wrist, part of the hand, that was me saying, see, I have now engraven you. you your names are always before me. Because they've been etched on my hands, and I cannot forget you. This is how much I love you, and I'm in love with you. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, do a miracle for me and my daughters. You heard their ache. They want me there, and I want them to be with me, and I love them, Lord. Please, Father, remove Martin Simon Yako. Every man remove them from their lives and convict their mother to repent and fear Jesus and fight for me, February 19. Deliver me from that judge. Deal with her, Lord. I can't fight this. Only you can. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Lord willing, pray for February 19. My kids, come to me. I ache for them so badly. I'm very lonely without them, but Jesus is my comfort. Uh, pray. Pray for 19 for a miracle and pray for the provisions. Lord willing, I'll see you Tuesday. I'll try to do a live stream Tuesday, if not earlier. Look for me Tuesday. Christ was risen, risen indeed. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Maranatha.